Good evening, everyone. My name is Arun Chokalingam. I am the chair of the technical committee for the Canada-India Healthcare Summit. And good morning to our colleagues in India. It's quite an early morning, and I'm glad you're all joining us. And this program is also available on Facebook Live, and the recordings will be made available through our website and other media. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the third and final webinar in the series leading to the summit of the Canada India Healthcare Summit scheduled on May 20th and 21st. And the topic is on artificial intelligence and its role in preventing COVID-19. We have got uh, an excellent set of speakers whose resumes, if we start speaking about it, that will take the whole hour. And their resumes and the bios are available on our website. I would encourage all of you to visit them and then to learn more about it. Uh, I'll come back to it later. In the meantime, let me invite and introduce Dr. Lakshmanan, who is the chair of the Canada India Healthcare Summit. And this is his brainchild. This whole summit is his brainchild. So Dr. Lakshmanan, please. Greetings, friends. Welcome to the webinar, the third webinar. It gives me great pleasure meeting you all from Canada as well as from India. The effort that we all are taking together is to make the quality of life for every citizen globally much better. We, go, we are now going through the challenge of COVID. Any better understanding to make our life better is a worthwhile effort. This summit is third of its kind. Canada India Foundation is doing with partners in Canada and in India. The first one we had in 2015 in Toronto. Second one was in Delhi in 2017 with the representatives from industry, uh, government officials, and uh, university academics coming together. The objective is how to work together and uh, to increase the efficiency, affordability, and the productivity. Towards that, our plenary speaker in India, Dr. Peter Reddy, the co-chair of Apollo, made a significant comment. She realized in Canada, we have this universal, uh, universal healthcare. Canada is excellent in R&D technology development. And she, she made a comment saying, through these conference, conferences, if we can make affordable care in India, bringing knowledge and technology from Canada, it will be very helpful. She mentioned the capital equipment in India is very high. By bringing technologies, if you can make the capital equipment much more affordable and make the uh, healthcare service much more affor affordable to all the citizens, it will be of great help. With that in mind, friends, today talking about artificial intelligence is very, very welcoming, welcoming journey. Thank you very much, all of you coming and contributing. Together, let us work to make sure the healthcare, how important it is, and also with your contributions, let us make sure that the uh, uh, use of artificial intelligence making healthcare much more affordable and also universally available in all parts of the world, our Canadian experience to be shared with all of our global friends in India. And I welcome you for this conference. Continue engaging, make partnerships, make relationships so that you can do research together, develop new products, make it available to global citizens, make it available to citizens in India as well as in Canada. Thank you very much for coming. Arun, thank you very much for your leadership. God bless. Thank you. Now, may I invite uh, the Consul General of uh, India in Toronto, Srimati Apurva Srivastava. Uh, Madam Srivastava, please go ahead with your remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arunji. 
Uh, namaskar and very good evening to all of you here in Canada and early morning to everybody in India. It's a great pleasure for me to join in today's session, the final, the third and the final session, which is being organized as a run-up uh, to the main summit in May. Uh, the topic is artificial intelligence and its contribution to overcome COVID-19. It's extremely relevant uh, today as the scientific community innovates to put in place a new healthcare framework to overcome the pandemic through use of high technology. My special thanks to Canada India Foundation, uh, Dr. Arun Chokalingam, Dr. Lakshmanan for putting this all together. Um, I would also like to thank all the expert speakers who have joined us today, both from India and Canada. Uh, you know, I'm really, uh, the way it, every, it, it uh, the whole, uh, the whole healthcare summit and the, the three webinars have shaved up. It's, it's really given me a great pleasure because uh, in our initial discussions where, you know, there was a discussion that it should have, the summit should bring concrete, uh, you know, uh, should either give concrete recommendations or there should be MOU signing. Uh, so this idea of three webinars came up and uh, I'm so happy that Dr. Lakshman and Dr. Joe Kalingam has put this together and what, what relevant topics, you know, basically uh, to, uh, to, uh, to enhance cooperation between uh, India and Canada. And this cooperation is not only for India or Canada, but it's, it's for the welfare of the whole hum hum humanity. Uh, you know, uh, be, be artificial intelligence uh, has turned out to be a powerful tool to detect and track the penetration of virus. You know, the it has come to play a critical role in managing real-time uh, data dashboards and management of social controls. Um, I really look forward to this session to get deeper insights on how AI contributes in overcoming the pandemic. Um, uh, in India also, we have been using uh, uh, AI for... Uh, for various uh, for medical uh, medical things, especially uh, post uh, post pandemic, uh, no, but uh, I I am sure that we have a lot to learn from Canada and uh, uh, we have uh, if you look at India we have set up this Arogya Setu app. Uh, uh, Indrapras Institute of Information Technology has developed an AI model that can repurpose medicines according to the highest success probability against the disease instead of going through the entire process manually. There are many examples. TCS is using AI to crunch down large molecules of drugs into highly effective molecules against the diseases. Uh, you know, in Kerala, uh, robots are being used for delivering hand sanitizers. Uh, IITs are working on various, uh, various issues so all these positive stories tell us that AI can be a very powerful tool as we develop treatment protocols uh, for combating the virus. Um, I'm sure this uh, deliberation like this one we are having today will be will surely stimulate ideas towards effective management of pan pandemic. Also, uh, it will uh, it will instill more you know cooperation between India and Canada. And uh, we uh, I would love to see more and more collaborations, more and more. Uh, MOUs in the field of uh, AI and uh, and medic medical field. Um, uh, with these words, let me stop here. Uh, and let me hear the experts and my best wishes for the success of this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Apurvachi. Thank you for your continuous encouragement throughout this process and all the time. And uh, as you rightly mentioned, Canada and India, particularly the IITs and many of the universities in Canada have already established collaborations. In fact, UFT has got a greater collaboration with IIT Madras and IIT Bombay. And uh, Dr. Faisal Beck from Simon Fraser University, he's having collaborations with people in IITs. And uh, in fact, he's an IITian. And we have got a couple of speakers in the, in the panel who are all IITians. Uh, uh, without any further ado, let me introduce the chair for the AI committee, Dr. Alex Mihalidis, who is uh, who will be moderating the session today. And Alex is also the associate vice president of research at uh, and international affairs at University of Toronto. Alex, please take over. Great. Well, thank you very much and welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us this evening. As I understand it, we have over a hundred people registered for tonight's session. So this is wonderful to see. Uh, thank you, Madam Consul General for joining us and giving us those wonderful opening remarks. And 
I can say in my role uh, in terms of international partnerships with the University of Toronto, that we learn uh, just as much from our colleagues in India as they do from us. And so this is a, a very fruitful relationship for Canada, particularly in the area of artificial intelligence. So as you can see from our agenda, we have uh, seven wonderful speakers who are going to talk about a variety of topics, um, all with the common thread of how artificial intelligence can help us overcome uh, the current situation we're with in, with, in terms of uh, COVID-19, but not during, just during the pandemic itself, but also living in a post-pandemic world as well. Um, as you'll see from our discussion and from our presentations, artificial intelligence is becoming very pervasive across all areas as, of health as related to COVID-19 and other applications as well. Now, having said that, I don't wanna to say too much more. I really wanna to get to our speakers. We will have time for an open moderated discussion after the fact. So please feel free to post your questions in the chat window that we can then pose to our speakers after they've all presented. So having said that, I'd like to now introduce our first speaker um, who's gonna come on and that's Dr. Raul Gopal Krishnan. I apologize for my pronunciation. So Dr. Raul, please take it away. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, hi everyone, it's a great pleasure to be here and speak to all of you uh, just about uh, research and it's really exciting to see such a diverse array of folks coming together to try and understand the role that AI can have in medicine, uh, both in the context of India as well as Canada. So my name is Rahul. I'm currently a senior researcher at Microsoft Research New England. And starting in fall 2021, I'll be an assistant professor in computer science and medicine at the University of Toronto. Next slide. So I wanna start by maybe showing everyone this chart. And uh, the reason I like this chart is because it's a very uh, clear indicator. And you know, this chart is specific to the context that North America is in, but I believe that this holds um, in a variety of different countries. And what we've seen in the last decade or so has been an explosion of growth in the amount of digital data that's being collected, organized, and stored by medical institutions around every country. And so this is just showing that in 2008, it was only 10% of hospitals in the United States that had an electronic health record. And if you were to compare that to something uh, like it is now, I would argue that it's, that chart has gone well over 90%. Next slide. And so uh, a natural question to ask is, what do we do with this data? So originally, this data was perhaps collected for administrative purposes. It might have been collected for billing. It might have been collected for trying to help doctors track their uh, legal requirements. But at the end of the day, people began wondering, can we do something more with this data? So this data that's being collected by hospitals is of a variety of different kinds and forms. You have medical images. You have data on inpatient health monitors, for, particularly for people who are suffering uh, from chronic diseases. You have medical exams. So every time you go to a doctor, the doctor write a note, writes a note, that note gets turned into a text and that text is saved in a record that is unique to you. You have patient generated health data. For those of you who have smart watches, all of these uh, watches track the number of steps you take and they're an indicator of the kind of lifestyle that you lead. And these indicators can in some sense uh, capture information about the overall health that an individual can have. And finally, you have laboratory results. If you were to go to see a doctor, they might ask you to take a blood test. That information is also tracked. And so there's two kinds of tasks that um, people who work in the intersectional field that I do ask. One of them is about unsupervised learning or subtype discovery, which is to say, if I take all of this data and ask the question, what are the different patterns that I can locate within this data? Are those patterns interesting or meaningful? then this is the task of subtype discovery. And so this, uh, the picture that you see in the top right is one where people have looked at data from um, women who suffer from breast cancer and understood that really it clusters in uh, a few different ways depending on the genetic information that's available about a patient. This is useful information. It tells us something about the disease. And so it's a way of turning data into insights that can then be used to change clinical practice in the future. Next slide. And the second use case 
oh, sorry, uh, the second use case uh, for um, this kind of data is to build clinical tools where we take the data that exists today and ask the question, how can we turn that data into insights that would help clinicians do their jobs faster? So in the next slide that I will show you, um, I'm gonna talk about a few success stories of doing that. So on, in the, the images that you see on the left are two examples of research papers that have shown that you can learn really good predictive models from medical images, which is to say you can take a, a data set comprising images of chest radiographs and the associated clinical labels for the underlying pathology that the patient was suffering from and train a, a machine learning model, a black box, which essentially takes as input the image and spits out what kind of label it is. In this case, the example is that of a patient who is suffering from pneumonia and the model show, shows you why it thinks the patient was suffering from pneumonia. In the middle is an example of a model that uh, can detect uh, breast cancer and risk prognosis in an automatic way from the images that have been stored in a hospital database. And finally, in the third slide, we have a different application, one that can predict the onset of a chronic disease like diabetes. So diabetes is a um, multifaceted disease that has a lot of factors that affect both its onset, its progression, as well as the eventual prognosis of patients who suffer from this disease. But it's documented that early interventions in the context of a disease like diabetes can have a positive effect on helping patients um, mitigate some of the, the bad ramifications from the disease progressing rapidly within them. And so predicting the onset of, the disease, of this disease early can help a healthcare system or a healthcare provider uh, act and intervene on these patients uh, at an earlier stage. And this is really another example of where machine learning can come in handy. Next slide. And so this begs the question, and really this is uh, uh, me trying to distill a lot of machine learning into one single slide. Um, and so if there's anything that you should perhaps take away from the minutes that I speak, it's perhaps this slide, which is how do we go from the data that we have in a hospital to insights that we might care to predict? Next. There's two critical ingredients that I'm going to talk about. The first one is that of domain expertise. And the second one is that of a machine learning model. And I'd argue that both of them are equally important to the successful deployment of any machine learning model to a predictive problem of interest. So domain expertise can come in many forms and sizes, but one of the critical ways that it comes in in the context of any machine learning model built on healthcare data is in the context of understanding which features are the most important and understanding how those features might relate to uh, an outcome of interest. Put differently, doctors have a wealth of knowledge from their own clinical experience as to what they, in, what they intuitively look for when they are trying to predict this outcome or when they are trying to anticipate an outcome. And the goal of this machine learning model is really to try and automate that clinical intuition. And so, in conjunction with the data and the domain expertise, a machine learning model essentially is a template matching algorithm. It tries to find patterns that doctors believe exist in the data and automate the detection of these templates for new patients in the future. And so if you put these three things together, what you get is the flowchart at the bottom where you have patient data, you have a trained machine learning model and you can begin to use this model to answer questions that may be of interest to a hospital administrator, such as what, will the patient need readmission or not? Next. And so I wanna you know, instantiate what this pipeline might look like in the context of the current pandemic, where we're dealing with a completely new disease that we don't understand uh, very, very well. And so, what do we have at our disposal that we might be able to make use of? Well, we have, um, unfortunately, a lot of patient data from hospitals around the world, both in India and Canada, for, for uh, individuals who have suffered from this disease. From biobanks, we might have a combination of both clin clinical as well as genetic information for patients who have been admitted for severe forms of COVID. And we can ask the question, can we automate the prediction of which individuals are likely to have a more severe response to being to COVID than others? 
And so we can take data that already exists from patients who've already gone through the hospital system and ask the question, well, I have all my patient clinical data along with their genetics. Can I train a machine learning model to, to, to put one whenever the patient might need intubation in the future and zero if they don't? And if, I, if I'm able to do this task successfully, then essentially what I've got is a way to assess the future risk of new patients who might come into the hospital. And the reason why this form of machine learning is particularly powerful uh, and this form of uh, this kind of problem is known as risk stratification, this uh, is particularly powerful is because it allows you, uh, next slide, to solve a variety of different and interesting clinical problems when this model is deployed in a clinic. And so in the context of actually using this model, you could, for example, um, deploy it in, in, in a clinic to assess the risk of individuals who are coming into the hospital with COVID in real time. You could also use it to figure out uh, prioritizations for individuals when, uh, on who to vaccinate when supply is scarce, which as we all know is currently the scenario. And finally, by introspecting into the model, we can perhaps begin to understand what drives the underlying uh, susceptibility to COVID. Next slide. And so I'm going to conclude by maybe highlighting a few aspects of what we as uh, a community of researchers and interested individuals need to do in order to tackle a problem like this or to make models like these more accessible, more usable, and to actually build them. There's several different challenges that arise from doing research in this area, and so I've highlighted three here. One of them is, uh, is just an, an, a legal issue. Patient data is typically uh, are protected by uh, HIPAA regulations, and uh, it's important to preserve the privacy of an individual when you're working with uh, sensitive data such as this. And so there's a variety of legal hurdles to overcome in this context. The second is data access. Data often lives in the hospital, but researchers often live in universities with computers. How do we connect the two in a seamless manner that makes it easy for researchers to, do, uh, to build these kinds of models faster? And finally, I think there's an important need to work with doctors, clinicians, nurses, and frontline workers to make sure that the data is interpreted correctly and that domain expertise drives the relevant research questions. Next slide. And so I think uh, I'm at time. Uh, and so I'll conclude there. Thank you so much. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion session at the end of this. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cheryl Khan. I'm a scientist at Kite uh, Toronto Rehabilitation Institute uh, in Canada. I'm also cross-appointed uh, with the biomedical engineering uh, department at University of Toronto, and I'm really excited to, to be here in front of uh, all of you and uh, sharing some of the uh, insights into some of the work that we have been, uh, that we have been doing. And today I'm specifically talking about uh, the, uh, the application of AI in long-term care and specifically for a case study, study that we did uh, in a dementia care unit. As you know that the world population is, is aging, you know, in just a couple of decades, uh, uh, in a couple of decades, you know, uh, the Canadian uh, old adults population 60 and above will be, you know, like around 25%, 23 to 25%. And India is also uh, along the same same path in, in just, you know, uh, two or three decades, we, we will see more than 20% 20, 20 of Indian population being older adult. Now, India being populous country, uh, this actually translates to hundreds of, uh, uh, you know, millions of people. So that can actually bring um, a major, uh, you know, pressure on the on the healthcare system. Now, aging is good. You know, we can spend more time with our elders of, of our family, but then, you know, aging also comes with certain, uh, you know, complexities. So for example, uh, physical and uh, cognitive uh, pr problems, you know, so for example, related to frailty, you know, older people tend to fall down, uh, uh, you know, fall more. And uh, you know, cognitive problems such as dementia. Now, uh, dementia is a, is, is a cognitive impairment uh, problem where, you know, part of your uh, brain cells start to shrink and then you, you, you uh, lose the tendency to memorize things. And in the worst case of dementia, uh, basically, you can uh, you may not recognize your family members. You may not remember where you are. One of the symptoms of dementia is agitation. Uh, older adults with dementia they often get agitated and they get very aggressive. Now, if they are living in a 
in a long-term care uh, facility or a nursing home, then uh, you know they, uh, these agitated behaviors, uh, you know, they can they can hurt themselves. Uh, they can even you know hurt the staff. So currently, the the the, the current way of doing this is actually uh, by observing uh, their behaviors. But those are like a, a retrospect, a retrospective, sorry, and uh, they cannot predict the onset of these behaviors. So to handle this problem, we actually did a study. Next slide, please. Uh, we, we, we did this study where we installed these multimodal sensors in a specialized dementia unit at Toronto Rehab. We ran this study for two years. We installed 15 cameras in the common hallways and the dining areas, and then we used this uh, multimodal wearable device, uh, as you can see, uh, that can record your motion and uh, other physiological data and some ambient uh, um, um, sensors like sleep, sleep, sleep mat and other types of devices. Uh, very early on, we actually realized that these uh, motion and door sensors may not be really good because the data was very noisy. They will they were firing uh, whenever you know because these units can have a lot of staff members and visitors and uh, you know other, other people walking around. So we discard. We actually did not use that data. Uh, then we started to build these uh, you know predictive models uh, using this multimodal sensor data we collected from these uh, wearable watches. So just to give you the context, we collected data from 20 people with dementia over a period of two years, uh, and we collected around 600 days worth of data. Next slide, next slide, please. Uh, in the past, it was shown uh, that accelerometer, which actually measures your motion, uh, can be a good indicator of agitation, but it can only pick up those type of agitations where a person is like physically moving or kicking or punching, you know. Uh, but there can be different types of agitation, you know, people may be just sitting and then maybe shouting or angry, you know, so, so the accelerometer may not be a, uh, may, may not be the best modality. Uh, so we use accelerometer, blood volume pulse, electrodermal activity, which is actually your, uh, uh, it, it captures the electrical uh, impulses on your skin from blood volume pulse, we can get heart rate and heart related features, skin temperature and things like that. And we showed that uh, when we combine all of this data, then uh, we get a very good uh, accuracy in terms of detecting these behaviors. Now I'm just showing you one of the very baseline results that uh, we, we, we obtained using a, um, a random forest classifier. So I'm omitting all the signal processing uh, you know, things that we did. So this was a very encouraging result for us. And currently my team is actually working on improving these models. Next slide, please. Uh, then we also collected, uh, you know, data, uh, these video data um, in the in the dementia unit, and we wanted to see, uh, we wanted to see, can we use this video data uh, to detect uh, these agitation behavior? Now, even though these agitation behaviors may be common in some of these dementia patients, but uh, but they are not happening all the time, and they are very few in in comparison to the normal activities. So we could, so as uh, Raul was saying, you know, maybe supervised uh, machine learning technique may not be a good fit for that. So we used unsupervised deep learning method where we train uh, the, the, these methods only on the normal activities. We did not tell the classifier what is agitation. We just uh, told the classifier, trained the classifier on normal activities. Can you please play the, the video? And here I'm showing you an actual video from the unit that we captured. Uh, uh, so here you will see a, a, a patient, you know, walking in the hallway, and then you will see in a in a few seconds that she will come and kick uh, another older older lady, uh, older patient. This is a very, in my language, it's a very beautiful result for us because we did not tell uh, the classifier what is agitation, but still it was able to detect this subtle behavior. So so you can see, you know, the the, the score actually went up. Uh, and then the lady walked away. Now, long-term care centers are very understaffed. You cannot monitor all these patients all the time. So, and this type of behavior, you know, see it just happened in a split of a second, right? So this type of technology, I think uh, the, the use of AI is very useful in actually determining these types of behaviors of risk or anomalous behaviors. And uh, this is a very exciting result. And currently we are, we are improving the, these models. Uh, next slide. Um, so many challenges. Uh, these are pretty much standard, which are more highlighted in this study. You know, we collected massive amounts of data, distributed data storage. Uh, all the data was going at different places. So now we are we learned from from this study, and we are developing our own system to you know 
put all the data at one place in the cloud. Um, there are issues with wearable data, you know, like 25% um, uh, of our population developed this tendency to remove the wearable devices, the very expensive staff consent and other, other, uh, other issues. Now, I would like to conclude with this, uh, uh, with, with this uh, um, uh, thing that I want to share is that we have actually started this study about the COVID patients. Now, when the COVID started, uh, we did not know what will be the effect of COVID on, on these dementia units. And this is a very vulnerable population. So currently we are actually collecting some data uh, using the indoor localization. So we want so, and we want to understand the, the, the changes in the, in the movement patterns uh, of these uh, patients, you know, pre and post COVID uh, um, and, dur and during the COVID pe period time and also to understand their social engagement and uh, how COVID has actually impacted the overall movement uh, and has it led to you know, more agitated behaviors or not. So we are currently uh, you know, collecting this data and, and I'm uh, hopeful that very soon we'll have some more results. So I'm very positive about uh, the role of AI in this vulnerable population. And uh, with this, I would like to say thanks for giving me the opportunity and I'm really, uh, you know, happy to uh, listen to other speakers. Thank you. Um, uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so uh, I'm Sarath Chander. Uh, I am an assistant professor at Polytechnic Montreal uh, at Montreal, Canada. And I'm also a core faculty member at MILA, the Quebec A Institute. Um, so today I'll be talking about reinforcement learning for drug discovery. Uh, so, so thanks to Rahul and uh, Cheryl, like, so they introduced supervised learning and unsupervised learning uh, for uh, all of you. So uh, in this talk, we are going to look at reinforcement learning uh, for drug discovery. So uh, first of all, drug discovery uh, is like a extremely costly process, right? Like, so, and it is also time consuming in the sense it could take like a period of six to 10 years to discover a drug, uh, but while we were, we were able to come up with a drug for COVID in a year, uh, which is a big achievement, but typically like given a disease, like it takes several years to come up with a drug. Uh, now it is like, now the, the question that I want to ask here is like, so can we design an artificial intelligent agent, which can actually decide like, like, like given a target disease can find the, the suitable drug for the disease, right? Like, so now this is in some sense automating the entire drug discovery process. Now, this is an extremely challenging question and uh, we cannot do supervised learning here because we don't have a lot of examples of like uh, how to discover drugs, right? Like uh, and similarly, we don't have a lot of, uh, like, like similarly, like, like doing unsupervised learning here is going to be extremely hopeless because this is a very difficult problem. So we're going to look at how to do drug, drug discovery, but uh, using uh, another type of machine learning uh, technique called reinforcement learning. Uh, okay, so the objective here is to generate synthesizable molecules that have desired properties, like so, like the properties could uh, be like could vary from like for example, like um, something which is specific to this disease, like so something which is soluble, right? Like so you could have a list of properties that you want these molecules to satisfy, and uh, like we are not just interest, interested in finding the drug, but we are also interested in uh, finding synthesizable drugs so that we can actually synthesize them in de novo drug this kind. Uh, next slide. Um, okay. Now, uh, like before I talk about reinforcement learning for drug discovery, like uh, I would like to talk about like what, uh, what are the existing uh, approaches uh, for like doing, like coming up with uh, an agent to do drug discovery. So next. Um, so the first line of uh, algorithms is like what we call as genetic algorithms, where the idea is you take a bunch of molecules and you do some crossovers, mutations, uh, and like come up with a new set of molecules. Now you test how good these new set of molecules are. Like, so you pick the best candidates, like uh, now with, with this best population, you repeat the process again and again. So you do this process over and over with the hope that eventually this population becomes better and better. And uh, at some point you might be able to find this drug, which is going to be useful for uh, the disease. Next. And there are also uh, other deep generative models uh, available in deep learning, where the idea is to directly generate uh, a drug uh, based on a list of characteristics. Uh, next. And there is some reinforcement learning based graph modification algorithms like where like you start with a part of the graph and you 
you generate uh, the whole molecule like step by step. Okay, so now these are the three uh, existing methods for uh, doing drug discovery. So one problem with all these methods is, so these methods would give you a drug which might actually work for uh, the target disease, but then none of these methods are going to guarantee you that you can actually synthesize these drugs, right? Like so. Now once you have the drug molecule, like sometimes it could it, it could it could so be the case that uh, the drugs are not synthesizable. Or it could be the case that you can synthesize the drug, but it is going to be an extremely costly reaction or time-consuming reaction that like synthesizing these drugs at large scale might not be possible. Next. Um, next. Okay. So there are some ways that people normally use to come up with uh, drugs which are synthesizable. For example, like with all these previous algorithms that I discussed, you could actually incorporate a synthetic accessibility score uh, next, so so this score uh, like is going to help uh, you to design uh, like to come up with drugs which uh, would actually have uh, higher chance of synthesizing, right? Like, but this is necessarily not not necessarily accurate. accurate. Like, so so this is just a, a soft guarantee. So there is no hard guarantee that you can actually synthesize these drugs. Next, uh, but also another point here is like so now this is becoming a difficult optimization process because you already have one objective which is to find the drug. Now you are adding another objective, which is that it has to be synthesizable. Next. Uh, so the second common approach that people use is to uh, like first find the drug which is going to be uh, a suitable uh, drug for a target disease, and then do some retrosynthesis where like you try to like analyze and see what are the ways to actually synthesize this drug. Okay, next. Uh, but there's no guarantee that this is going to be working. Uh, so now in the next slide, we're actually going to see uh, a way to synthesize drugs, uh, like, like to, to come up with agents, uh, which will actually give you drugs which are synthesizable. Uh, okay, next. Uh, okay, so how are we going to do this? Like, so we, we are going to do this by actually learning to search over the valid chemical reactions at every time step, next. Uh, so we will start with some existing molecule, next. And once I have a molecule, I'm going to decide what reaction I'm going to do with this molecule and what reactant uh, would be the second reactant for this reaction, okay? So next. Now I apply this reaction and I'm going to get the product of the reaction. Now this product of the reaction is going to be the state for the next time step. So in some sense, I start with a small molecule and I do a, a sequence of valid chemical reactions and then come up with a final uh, drug. Okay, so now uh, how can we automate this process? Uh, so that's what we are going to see in the next couple of slides next. Uh, so, so this has a lot of challenges uh, like for the current generation artificial intelligence systems. For example, uh, like you need to choose from 150,000 possible reactions, right? Like so like a, a random choice is not going to work, right? Like so when, when, when a human scientist is trying to do drug discovery, like so he knows uh, or he he has a clue about like what reactions he should try like so he's not going to randomly pick one out of 150,000 reaction next uh, and and sometimes even after choosing the first template you have a lot of reactions available next so so this kind of uh, um, setting is is extremely difficult for existing reinforcement learning algorithms uh, next so the like so the one solution that we propose uh, is to basically predict a continuous action in the representation of the reactants so that you never pick one out of K reaction, reactants. Like, so you, you come up with a continuous representation of this reactant and then pick the most closest reactant uh, in this representation. So, so this kind of uh, like, uh, like modified machine learning technique uh, actually enabled us to like search over the space of 100 for, like 150,000 molecules and like 30,000 reactants. Uh, and like we were able to actually come up with meaningful drugs for the kind of problems that we tried on. Next. Uh, so here is an example, right? Like, so you start with some drug and the first in the first step, the agent has to pick one out of many chemical reactions that are available. Uh, next. In the second step, the agent also selects a reactant. Uh, so out of the space of reactants that are available uh, and then it, may, it does the reaction and then it gets a reward, which is some score here, like 5.58. And the goal of this agent is going to try more and more reactions in such a way that it is going to get maximum reward or, or like larger and larger rewards. Next. 
So this animation actually explains the entire process. Like, so you first select the reaction and then you select the reactant. So you do the selected reaction. Now this is going to generate a new product, right? Now this product is associated with a reward which says how likely that this is going to solve the disease, like, like uh, cure the disease, right? Like, so, so now you continue this process again and again. And eventually this agent is going to learn uh, like how to come up with a sequence of chemical reactions, which is going to get you this one particular drug, uh, which is guaranteed to be synthesized, like synthesizable here, because we are actually learning to synthesize. Uh, and, and, on, and also uh, hopefully this is going to uh, like uh, work well with the target disease. Next. Uh, so we tested this with a bunch of desirable properties uh, that people uh, usually care, care about, like drug likeliness or uh, like, like C-log P, which is the measure of molecules, uh, lipophilicity and so on. And also we tested uh, our agent with um, like, uh, like a, a bunch of HIV targets uh, so that, uh, that were given to us from the ChemBL library. Next. So you can see that uh, I, I did not explain like all the technical details of our agent, like so our agent, which is called PGFS, you can see that when compared to a random search agent, which is just randomly searching over the po like possible uh, space of chemical reactions is actually doing much better. So, so you can see uh, that, uh, for example, in the bottom line, like you can see that uh, like we are getting uh, like a lot of gen compounds, compounds that this method is generating uh, is actually uh, like, uh, like more, likely to solve uh, the problem in hand uh, than the random search. Next. Um, so like you can see that when compared to other state of thought algorithms, like, uh, like we do better in all the uh, metrics, probably these are not very interesting. So next, uh, next. Uh, okay, so I would like to summarize like by saying that like we have a state of the art reinforcement learning system for searching in the space of synthesizable drugs. Uh, so this is novel in the sense uh, there was no uh, earlier work where people can actually guarantee that any drug that the artificial intelligent agent is uh, generating uh, is actually synthesizable. Uh, next. Uh, so like what is challenging about drug discovery is like, uh, like it also introduces a lot of challenges to the current generation AI systems and uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, so which, which, which is what we are currently focusing on next. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, like I want to tell for people like who are working on the drug side that uh, oral is the most promising approach to learn to search through this exponential space of uh, unexplored drugs. Um, next, uh, I think uh, this summarizes my talk. Like so, so I talked about the first work, but we have a series of work. Uh, next, so we have a series of work uh, in this direction. Like if you're interested uh, in reading more about reinforcement learning for drug discovery, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mirza Fasil Beg. I'm a professor in the School of Engineering Science here in Vancouver at Simon Fraser University. Originally from Bhopal, India, and I did my undergrad at IIT Kharagpur. So I have deep connections with India. I'm really pleased to uh, and honored to present to you today a little bit of my research in AI for estimation of body composition from CT images towards uh, 3D measurements. So CT imaging has become the mainstay of clinical medicine uh, or commonly acquired, routinely acquired in the clinic. We want to use the CT images to automate the extraction of individual patient measurements and use them for better prediction of clinical outcomes. So I'll explain this in just the next slides. Next, please. So a body composition, which is the amount of skeletal muscle and fat inside the body, is a very important uh, measurement metric for pr prediction of what the individual's response will be to surgery, to treatment, or to clinical uh, administration of chemotherapy. So chemotoxicity medicines uh, are, are, uh, are metabolized by the skeletal muscles. So the amount of skeletal muscle directly predicts the amount of Chemotoxic medicine the individual can handle. For, in, for ident identical height and weight, the skeletal muscle mass can vary substantially. Some individuals have more fat in their body and less muscle, and others have more muscle and less fat. And this amount of variation in skeletal muscle can explain a lot of variability in clinical outcomes, especially in cancer treatment. So the same dose, which is based on weight, can become an overdose for individuals that have less muscle. And the same dose uh, based on weight again can become an underdose for those that have more muscle. Now CT images actually provide a direct visualization of internal anatomy 
And so we can actually use these to measure the amount of muscle and fat in individuals precisely. However, in the past, only 2D single slice measurements have been used because of ease of measurement. So the questions are, can we actually do better than use just 2D single slice measurements from CT images of muscle and fat? Uh, how can we do that? Are there other measurements that we can acquire from CT images that can allow us to predict the response of the individual to their treatment or to the surgery? How can we extract these measurements with convenience so that we can enable large scale biomarker discovery as well as incorporate them in clinical workflows? Next slide, please. So there are a lot of methods that are available now in the literature um, to extract measurements of muscle and fat from single CT slices, for axial slices, you know, one cut across the abdomen uh, horizontally like this. But these are not enough, these are not adequate. Next slide, please. Now these became mainstay of clinical medicine because this paper in 2004 showed that we can actually correlate single slice measurements to whole body measurements. This paper showed that if you take a measurement at the L4, L5 level, and then plus five centimeters, then the skeletal muscle measurement from that level correlates with the whole body measurement. And then minus five centimeters from L4, L5, the fat measurement at that level correlates to the whole body fat level. So the field started using measurements from one single slice because it was easy to, to contour and to manually outline one single slice to measure fat and muscle. However, that single slice measurement may not be enough for predicting whole body for the individual as shown in the middle panels over here. Even if we know the single slice measurement, there's a lot of variability in correlating that from single slice measurement to the whole body level. So these are not accurate enough. There's variability of like 15 to 30%. And that 15 to 30% may make a difference between successful treatment or overdose. So, uh, now in this paper itself, the, these authors had written that the method that generated and developed using regression lines was actually used for group studies where you are analyzing large groups of individuals together in mass and not for single individual prediction. However, as things go, it became the mainstay of research in this field for the last 15 years. Next slide, please. So our goal was to improve the measurement of muscle and fat, first from going from manual measurements of one single slice to automatic measurements of that single slice, like in shown in the top panel. And we built a deep learning machine learning algorithm to automate this process. The second goal was to now go from 2D measurements to full 3D measurements. If we have a CT image, which typically have anywhere from 500 to 1000 axial slices, as you can imagine, it's really tedious to, to contour these manually. So now we have an AI algorithm that actually contours all of these slices for muscle and fat. Next slide, please. So here is shown uh, on the top row, manual segmentations, manually outline muscle from all these CT uh, slices. And on the bottom row is shown automatic segmentation generated by this uh, AI algorithm. And as you can see visually, there's a very close concordance between the two. We can, in fact, we cannot tell uh, any difference between the two. They are so good. Next slide, please. And here we can see a segmentation of the bone, with the bony structure of the individual along with the intra, uh, intra-abdominal fat. And you can see that the intra-abdominal fat and bone from manual measurements are almost identical to automatic measurements. And one also sees this great variability in intra-abdominal fat for different individuals, which one needs to measure and is right now not measured and incorporated in clinical workflows in order to predict the response of this individual to various treatments and or surgical outcomes. In fact, one of these surg surgeries, pancreatic surgery, for example, has a, has a failure rate or complication rate of 40%. And the intra the uh, intraabdominal fat, the visceral ab abdominal ad adipose tissue, is recognized as one of the barriers to the complications that one sees in pancreatic surgery because the surgeon has to go through many layers of this vascular uh, visceral abdominal fat to get to the pancreas. Next slide, please. Here is shown uh, subcutaneous adipose tissue, this fat under the skin, along with internal organs like the liver and the spleen. And again, one sees the immense amount of variability in individual organs seen from different individuals. And these organs can also, this variability can also 
uh, predict or influence the outcomes that are that are the result of treatment or surgery. Next slide, please. So again, I'm here I'm showing different organs automatically segmented from a large number of individuals. These are the lungs, the kidney, the liver, the spleen, and the, the visceral adipose tissue, the belly fat. And you can see this great amount of variability in internal organs in all of these individuals. And the amazing thing is now we have AI-based algorithms that can actually estimate these in, in a few minutes. So saving a great amount of uh, time, labor, and potentially bringing these technologies to the cheapest, to the poorest clinics around the world. Next slide, please. So now this is a slide showing the large number of individuals. We can automatically process and estimate these measurements very easily without a lot of effort. What would take hours and days and months in the past can be done in a few seconds or a few minutes. Next slide, please. So the big uh, goal now is to use CT images or uh, medically acquired images, even MRIs can substitute here to measure all the organs inside the body precisely and automatically, and then use these organs in terms of machine learning framework to, uh, to align them with the sociodemographic factors of the individual, the genetic uh, measurements if available, the lifestyle, the cardiometabolic factors, the physiological factors, and use all of these measurements to predict the individual clinical outcomes. Because the big variable, you have the same surgery for the individual, you have the same treatment for the individual, but the big variable is the individual themselves. And when the individual changes, the outcomes change. So if you can make all the measurements to describe the individual, the hope is, the hypothesis is, that the outcomes can be predicted much more accurately in advance. Next slide, please. So now we build this algorithm that takes lots of images and automatically segments them um, through our data analysis facilitation suite. This is a small startup company, Voronoi Health Analytics, that provides this software. Uh, it's available for use and for download and for purchase. Next slide, please. And then we can also provide an annotation of different vertebral levels. Next slide, please. You can find the L3 vertebra, the T4 vertebra, or all the vertebral levels that allows you to now measure these measurements de depending on the vertebral levels and allow them to compare across individuals. Next slide, please. So different, sometimes the clinical images are acquired with different fields of view. So you cannot directly compare a smaller field of view with a larger field of view. So having this kind of a technology will allow us to then compare the like fields of view from different individuals, for example, the L3 level measurements or the T4 level measurements and so on. Next slide, please. So here is the main uh, goal that we are working on. Use our software to segment all the organs inside an individual based on available labeled clinical data where we know the clinical outcomes of surgery or treatment for these individuals, develop a prediction model that predicts what these outcomes will be for that particular kinds of measurements that go into that treatment. Once a new subject comes in, a new patient comes in, we can then perform the same measurements and use the previously trained clinical model that other speakers have spoken about to make the prediction of this individual for the given treatment or for the given surgery. So this is essentially a instantiation of precision medicine for uh, individuals using AI. And then it can be used in different clinics and different workflows all around the world. Next slide, please. And with this, I want to thank my team and I want to thank the organizers, so Dr. Chokalingam, uh, especially, and Dr. Mihalidis for giving me a chance to speak before you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning to uh, fellow colleagues and friends in India, and good evening to those uh, on the West Coast, uh, East Coast. Uh, I'm going to be talking, uh, my name is Vidur Mahajan. I, I run the Center for Advanced Research in Imaging, Neurosciences and Genomics here in New Delhi. Uh, we are essentially a translational research group that's part of a large uh, diagnostics company called Mahajan Imaging. Uh, I'm going to be talking uh, about what it takes to uh, clinically deploy AI solutions uh, into the workflow. Next, please. So, you know, there is absolutely no doubt that AI is the future of medicine, you know, uh, there's a huge market, there's increasing investment, it reduces costs, you know, it, it's everywhere. Uh, I won't go deep into this. So please, next, please. And at the same time, you know, real world adoption is lacking. In fact, there's a question on this uh, in the Q&A as well, where, you know, there's hundreds of AI developers across the world that are building discrete analytic solutions. 
There's uh, a lot of challenges around trust and bias in AI. And then finally, let's say we build that, you know, amazing algorithm that can be used in the clinic. How do we even get it integrated into hospitals is a huge, huge challenge. And this, I put this chart here just to show that, you know, it's estimated that $6 billion are going to be spent only on health IT integration with it, which means, you know, it's just a huge, huge challenge. Uh, so next slide, please. And, you know, trust uh, in itself can only be built by uh, addressing the following problems, right? So uh, you need to think about implications of AI. So in healthcare, everything is about implications, right? What happens? We don't care if it's 99.9% uh, accurate or 99.999% accurate. We care about what happens to the point one, And that's why it's very important to get this implications-based thinking uh, to see what happens if the AI goes wrong. Then there's technical issues. I'm sure my colleagues uh, on the panel are very well versed with, you know, the issue of generalizability. Will AI built on one type of uh, data actually work on another data set? There's bias, you know, there's ethical issues and legal issues. So, uh, but, but trust in a medical device, so to say, it can only be built by addressing these problems. So next slide, please. And this, uh, we believe, can be solved by an operating platform. So if you think of it, there are three key stakeholders in this AI ecosystem, right? There's the healthcare providers uh, on, on one hand, then there's the analytics providers or the so-called AI companies on the other hand, and currently they are bridged by this, uh, uh, by, by what I call health tech providers that are the hospital IT manufacturers or tax companies, HIS companies, uh, all of these companies. So what we believe is that, you know, somehow all of these uh, players need to come onto a same singular platform uh, in order for AI to be used with the way in the way that we want. And uh, next slide, please. That's where Carpool comes in. So Carpool is, uh, you know, uh, the color schemes a little changed because of the pasting of the slides, but, but Carpool is what we are building. It's a decentralized unifying technology platform that connects these three ecosystems, right? The data ecosystem, which is the healthcare providers, the analytics ecosystem, which is the AI developers, and then the tech enablement ecosystem, which is the health tech companies that actually make all of this stuff happen. But what does it actually mean? So next slide, please. Well, we have four platform pillars within Carpool, right? So what we believe is that in order to bring AI into the clinic, you need to first and foremost have developer support. You need to give access to developers to data. You need to allow them to manage their data. You need to help them annotate that data. And finally, uh, as was uh, beautifully put out by Dr. Rahul Gopal Krishnan, you need domain expertise to help with model development. Then you need to give these uh, companies access to markets, access to data. Then you need to help them build out user trust, which is what I'll go into deeper in a bit, uh, where you know we've built out a validation platform. There's automated testing pipelines. Uh, you know, explainability has to be inherently a part of AI, at least today, uh, for for its widespread adoption. And then finally, you know, you need to have very very simple ways of deploying these into into hospitals because. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, from a tech perspective, hospitals are fairly simple and, uh, you know, they, they just want uh, solutions that work. Uh, so please, next slide. And this is an example of uh, a snapshot of our, uh, of our platform where we show that, you know, you can actually automatically uh, validate chest X-ray AI solutions. You know, you, you, once you have the data, once you have the labels, and once you have the model outputs, you can automatically create AUC curves, which are, you know, uh, which is a way for testing out what the classification ability of an algorithm is. Uh, you can do, you know, you can modify thresholds. You can do things like, uh, you know, let's say you want to figure out what the performance of an algorithm is at 95% sensitivity. You can do that. Uh, you can review failed cases, right? This is one of the most important aspects of clinical validation of AI is to have the ability to truly see where AI failed. And then uh, once you're done with all of that, uh, you just click a single button and out pops a validation report, which you can literally hand to a clinician or to the head of a department to show that, hey, this is these are two AI algorithms and this these are the, their respective performances on our data, right? It all has to be done on the hospital's data. You know, we literally call it hyper-localized 
uh, AI validation where we go to scanner level, right? Even if you have three different machines in the same hospital, three different x-rays, you need to test out AI on all three x-rays because you don't know, maybe this resolution is off in one of them. Maybe, you know, there's something wrong with the sensor that the human eye can't pick up. So, so that's why, you know, we built out these tools. Next slide, please. And there's different methods for different algorithms. You know, there's classification algorithms, detection algorithms, and, uh, and super resolution algorithms. These are three broad categories of algorithms that are available today. And you need to test them out, each of them very, very specifically. Please, next slide. Uh, and the same thing applies for deployment, right? Uh, you know, there's a different, this table is just there to show that, you know, there's a different way for doing each one of these algorithms. Next slide, please. So this is uh, this is an example of uh, you know uh, what uh, three years ago used to be the prefer uh, the way of deploying AI in the clinic. You know many people still use this, where where you literally draw uh, you know these ROIs uh, over uh, you know over these uh, these images, and then you know they cannot be fixed. But what we are going to now is the ability for giving the doctor the ability to change these uh, regions of interest and. Uh, you know, change the model outputs and then subsequently also share model feedback with doctors. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of deployment, very interesting example where we automatically marked out x-rays as normals and then normal reports were inserted into, uh, into, the, uh, into our radiology information systems. Uh, but just uh, click next, please. But what we realized that, uh, you know, the AI was always wrong, uh, was always right when it was giving out a normal report because we had tweaked it to be so. So the radiologists, uh, you know, started nudging each other to figure out when the AI was wrong. So this was a very interesting thing, you know, uh, that we, uh, we presented this at the European Congress of Radiology, where the behavioral impact of AI actually had a counterproductive effect. So next slide, please. And uh, this is just, uh, you know, closing out. Uh, this is an example of a super resolution algorithm where we take a grainy image on the left. This is a low radiation dose image, CT scan, that is, uh, you know, made into a nicer looking, more diagnostically acceptable, uh, super resolved image on the right. This is work we did with this company called Pixel Shine. Uh, next slide, please. And similar work uh, in MR. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, you know, uh, clinical deployment has to follow the ability to access, test, and integrate AI uh, into a hospital, right? It's not like you've created the AI and now, you know, the world is going to start using it. You need to give your user the ability to uh, grab hold of the AI, then open it up and look at it, right? It's like an interview. It's If, if AI is supposed to be a cognitive assistant, you know, you need to be able to uh, to test it out to that extent, then every algorithm is different. Deep integration is preferred, right? The, the doctor should have the same seamless experience across the board and pre-deployment validation is key. And, you know, we keep harping on this concept that you need to test, test, test uh, the app. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, with that, I thank you for your attention and looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vibhat Tyagi, and I'm the manager of Applied Research Partnerships. Um, a little about my background. I have a PhD in biotechnology, and I'm from IIT Roorkee. And I did postdoc in proteomics at uh, University of Toronto. And then I moved to the community college to uh, manage and administer the research. So I'm not a researcher myself, but I do administer research and work very closely with small and medium enterprises uh, to help them solve technical challenges, help them innovate and be more efficient and productive. So basically translating into direct, direct economic impact. So that's why, uh, and I'm very thankful to and Dr. Chokalingam to provide me with this an opportunity to provide a very different perspective on uh, how the small and medium, specifically small and medium enterprises um, uh, survived and how AI helped them in the COVID times. Next slide, please. So um, as the COVID hit and the loss of businesses had closed their doors to stop the spread of COVID-19, uh, the small businesses came to a halt because they just didn't know how to 
um, they they were very vulnerable. So um, so what happened was um, uh, the there's no way to tell exactly uh, what the economic damage would be because of COVID nineteen because there will be a lot of effect has yet to come, but um, this is for sure that the global economy has shrank by three percent in twenty twenty, and uh, and then there is, it is much worse than what it was during the 2008-2009 financial crisis. So the economists have estimated that a GDP loss of 4.5% has already been, has already been, you know, uh, realized. And to put this number in perspective, if I uh, want to, the global GDP is estimated at around 87.55 trillion US dollars in 2019, meaning that a 4.5% drop um, in the economic growth amounts to almost 3.95 trillion US dollars in lost economic output. So, and this is a report and in a, the AIMF uh, chief economist, Gita Gopinathan, she forecasts that the this crisis could knock off around $9 trillion off the global GDP over the next two years. So this is just to give you an, a little like a bird's eye view of what the global economic impact is of the COVID-19. Next slide. So the key sectors, uh, and I've highlighted just five sectors here, but there is a lot more under the surface, but I'm just um, highlighting the major top five sectors that have really taken the COVID impact. So, and you all are quite aware of this as like healthcare, which is, which is really, oh, I mean, it, is, it has been overburdened. So um, you can see that, you know, there's been a shortage of trained care professionals, and then there is a overcrowded hospital facilities. Uh, the education, where the teachers had to adapt very quickly to a world of almost universal distant education. So there was a, a lot of disruptions that this sector has seen, then travel, uh, tourism, and aviation, which was a major driver of jobs and growths. But COVID-19 has dramatically changed this uh, industry as well. Then manufacturing saw lots and lots of closures and also uh, the supply chain disruption, rising costs, and then agriculture, where the farmers were working hard to feed the world, but a lot of agriculture workers were unable to really lift themselves out of the supply chain disruptions and the food security insecurity. Next, please. So uh, my why, why I really want to focus on small and medium enterprises because they represent about 90% of businesses worldwide and more than 50% of employment. So they are the most important segment of the business world. Uh, in the U.S. alone, the small and medium enterprises, they employ nearly half of the working population and generate 45% of the GDP. So, and why they are so vulnerable? Because first of all, uh, they quick, they like their operations and employment gets impacted pretty fast. They have financial fragility. And also the crisis, if, if a, a crisis of a smaller duration, they can still sustain. But this crisis has really, really been uh, we all know that it's been over a year now that they have been really finding this very difficult to deal with. So um, next slide. So how did they manage to survive? If I'm not saying revive, but definitely survive. And yes, a lot of them have revived too, um, to go back to the never normal. That is the hard irony. So they, um, first of all, they, again, five major, major highlighted uh, actions that they took to they search the responses the business they continued their business they tried to bring about the financial stabilization and sustainability they improved their communication and collaboration and they really were on top of their monitoring and reporting so to search the responses they scaled their virtual operations so why i brought these five points uh, here is that these all five factors that help the small businesses uh, was it was made possible only by the technology, by going digital, because they search responses by scaled virtual operations, by launching virtual assistants, the AI chatbots, they could really take over the frequently and redundant questions and then saving the time for the other employers to you know, em employees to focus on other strategic tasks. 
For business continuity, again, they elevated the role of technology to assess and address the supply chain and telecommuting. Financial stability, they captured and managed new demands. And communication and collaboration, they again, they did the, with the help of digital and virtual assistants and monitoring and reporting, they use data and analysis to inform decisions and assess uh, critical impacts. So next slide. So uh, it is a, a recent survey, the McKinsey survey has shown that lots of businesses that did well, they accelerated the use of AI in their key tasks, such as um, to forecast and manage capacity, carry out mission critical tasks without reliance on heroic human efforts. So uh, it did add value to business workflows. So around 68% uh, of the businesses increased their investment in AI and 77% agreed that yes, AI will definitely help them uh, to slow down the effect of COVID on the businesses. And the other figure that I show here is again a McKinsey report, which shows that, you know, uh, the sectors, so it shows the two-way impact of AI on businesses. Uh, on the right-hand side is the uh, revenue increase, but on the left-hand side is the uh, saving of costs. And the saving of costs, again, at this time is crucial. So the company, the uh, marketing and sales sector saw a lot of revenue increase by adopting AI, whereas the manufacturing and um, supply chain sectors, they saw lots of saving in the cost because of adoption of AI. Next slide. So uh, how did the companies uh, adopted AI? So uh, industries such as mining, energy, manufacturing, and food production, they use computer vision and also robotics for quality assurance. And then companies, they invested in cloud computing technologies. Next slide. Uh, then uh, the consumer behavior changed. So online shopping, e-commerce platforms, uh, and also virtual custom service, customer service agents. And also when the employees are coming back to work, they're adopting more AI-based process automation softwares. Next. Um, the three things, so this slide is very crucial. Those three things that pandemic changed AI is, uh, you know, uh, we all know and uh, my esteemed co-panelists, they are the researchers in AI and they know that it takes time to build a machine learning model and then train it with the data and this lot of data. So what happened here was we really wanted some AI algorithms fairly quickly in shorter time frames. So so what what they did is that they quickly built the minimum viable models and then trained them and validated them. And also, secondly, they built scenario-based stimulations. And the third way they quickly changed was they built a model and then they augmented it with the historical data. So, so that's how the use and the development of AI also changed because of pandemic. Next. So, um, Although you've seen uh, like a huge uh, impact of um, AI, that AI can make difference in the healthcare, but I just uh, kept this slide to show you that not only in clinical and operational, but also in administration, the AI helps our healthcare sector and also in the financial sector. So um, I will wrap up this uh, just by saying that we I, in Durham College, we worked very closely with one or two hospitals to predict using AI to predict uh, emergency wait times. And during the pandemic, it was very helpful because the, the patients didn't have to wait in the emergency room and they really get their personalized, customized waiting times. So with that, I think this is my last slide. Yes, thank you. And I'm happy to take the questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Tyagi, and, and thank you, uh, uh, the organizers and the, and the panelists. Uh, so I'm Parasul Patel. Uh, I am uh, an investor with Radical Ventures. We invest in early stage AI startups. Uh, so I just wanted to take a few minutes to share uh, my perspectives uh, on investing in, in AI startups at the intersection of healthcare and how the COVID pandemic has uh, affected uh, uh, the adoption of AI, uh, especially in healthcare and what we are seeing from, uh, from the investor lens. So with that, uh, can you have the next slide, please? Uh, so on the, 
left here, uh, there is a chart which one of my colleagues, Sanjana, put together. And this is how we think about uh, adoption of technology and AI uh, in the healthcare setting. Uh, we believe that the first wave of innovation involves uh, mass scale uh, adoption of technologies which create kind of the digital infrastructure, which then allows the second wave of technologies uh, such as AI to be used. Uh, a lot of uh, the co-panelists have talked about the use of data for training AI models. Certainly, if we don't have the infrastructure to train the AI models and deploy them, uh, we cannot uh, actually put them in production. Uh, and the first wave kind of enables them. Uh, next animation, please. And what the pandemic did was it really pulled forward uh, the first wave uh, of, uh, of adoption here. Uh, so if you can have the next animation. Uh, so we think of the pandemic as a digital uh, health inflection point. Uh, and it did uh, three things uh, to really accelerate the adoption. So the first were systemic changes, uh, which uh, changed how uh, the regulators look at uh, AI systems uh, and how the payers, uh, especially with the, with the US context, uh, uh, the payers looked at uh, services that are rendered digitally. So uh, as all of us have, have seen uh, with the really fast approval of, of vaccines, which typically takes a significantly longer amount of time uh, and a fast approval of uh, diagnostics that, uh, that came about over the last year, that in addition to all the changes that have been going on over the last uh, few years on uh, adopting software as a medical device, uh, and a lot of those uh, uh, approaches use AI, uh, have significantly changed how we think about adoption of AI technologies going forward. Uh, now, with the pandemic, uh, the public at large has also started uh, changing the behavior. So telehealth, uh, which has been around for a substantial uh, period of time, uh, some of the older telehealth companies have been around for more than a decade, uh, but the adoption that all of these companies saw over the last uh, year has been unprecedented. And with, uh, with patients adopting telehealth, first, for just the, the very basic fact of connecting with their providers, they are now starting to get more and more comfortable with the digital uh, tools uh, that give them kind of medical advice. Uh, and then finally, uh, technology, uh, including AI, has been used for a number of uh, advances that happened over the last year. So the Moderna vaccine, which was one of the first vaccines to be developed, uh, and, uh, and uh, some of this is already uh, kind of well-known publicly, but they were very, very quick in developing the vaccine. It, it took them uh, less than a few days to actually develop the vaccine using a lot of uh, advances over the last decade. And, and a lot of those advances include uh, use of AI for developing vaccines uh, and then clinical trials. And as we think about clinical trials, everything from identifying the right patients to deploying them in clinical trials, monitoring the clinical trials and so on, uh, the adoption of technology has significantly uh, increased uh, including uh, decentralized clinical trials where you can now run clinical trials across multiple locations, not have to rely on a large uh, facility in, in a big city uh, to run those clinical trials. So we think uh, the pandemic essentially created this inflection point, which just like the change in e-commerce or, or telehealth adoption, it will now uh, lead to a new normal in the uh, in the pace of adoption uh, of these technologies. So if we move to the next slide, uh, here I'm highlighting a few examples of uh, technology solutions. And, and I come from uh, uh, the, primarily the startup world. So, so I've highlighted a few examples of startups uh, who really helped solve uh, issues that have come up uh, because of the pandemic. So the first uh, piece on the, on the left uh, talks about the detection of, uh, of COVID-19 and uh, a uh, couple of my co-panelists have talked about using X-ray, CT scans, MRIs uh, for uh, different diseases. They were also, there were many uh, startups and researchers who came up with models to detect uh, COVID-19 through, through CT scans and X-rays. Uh, second is an example of a company called Blue Dot, uh, which is a startup based here in Toronto. They were actually one of the first uh, organizations outside of uh, China to actually call, uh, uh, call attention to what was happening uh, at that time uh, located in Wuhan, that there is uh, uh, a respiratory disease that's, that's going on. And they actually identified this in late 2019. Uh, they use uh, uh, worldwide traveler data uh, at scale in an anonymized format 
to identify COVID hotspots, and now they've been adopted, adopted by a number of uh, government agencies around the world. Uh, and then finally, there's an example of a, a, a very early stage startup called Poppy, which uses a whole suite of sensors in a built environment to identify if social distancing rules or if uh, limited capacity uh, rules in that built environment are actually affecting how the, the pathogen is, uh, is spreading. Uh, and if we move to the next one, uh, access to healthcare. Uh, certainly because uh, many hospitals reduce the number of uh, 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 kind of non-critical uh, patient visits, uh, there was definitely need for alternative solutions. We've talked about kind of telehealth, uh, but mental health also uh, took a big hit. And there are many, many startups that are addressing this problem by connecting uh, patients to the right providers in, in the mental health setting. We have a portfolio company called Pocket Health, uh, which is a great example of increasing access to healthcare using technology. They, uh, they provide patients uh, and providers access to medical imaging records in a very easy to transfer fashion. Uh, right now, if you're unfortunate to uh, break an arm or a leg and you go to a hospital, uh, they will actually burn a CD or a DVD for you uh, if you need to get a second opinion or, or get a referral. Uh, Pocket Health uh, completely automates it uh, with a digital platform. Next animation, please. Uh, and then we've talked about accelerating therapeutics. Uh, some of the co-panelists have talked about AI for drug discovery, uh, and I, I just mentioned AI for clinical trials. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so across kind of the, the different examples that I highlighted, I, I believe, uh, and, and we believe that AI will affect pretty much all uh, aspects of the healthcare ecosystem from therapeutic discovery uh, to AI-assisted disease diagnosis to different forms of disease treatment uh, everything from personalized precision medicine, digital therapeutics, uh, to also making sure that we adhere to treatments and then driving process efficiencies. So we don't have a doctor uh, staying up till 10 p.m. writing down notes, which is uh, a totally non-productive use of their time. Uh, and then finally, uh, the next animation, please. Uh, it is important to address the challenges, challenges which come up with the use of AI. Uh, we need to develop solutions which uh, address uh, all patient populations if data sets that are used to uh, identify air treatments are biased either from uh, a race perspective or a gender perspective, uh, then they will not be, in, in some cases, they might not be applicable to, to all populations. Uh, we've talked about patient data privacy before. Uh, there are also technological solutions to solve some of those problems, uh, federated le learning, synthetic data, differential privacy, the multiple approaches that are being tested right now to, uh, uh, to, to solve for that issue. Uh, we've talked about equitable access, which is important, uh, especially for, uh, for a country like India, where there are large populations uh, that are still uh, struggling to get access to basic healthcare. Uh, and then change management, I think a couple of my co-panelists talked about it, including both uh, retraining uh, the entire kind of provider system, and, and that's not just doctors, but also nurses and technicians involved in giving care, as well as uh, aware, uh, bringing awareness in the broad population to make sure uh, that they are not afraid of, of a new technology coming and helping them out. So with that, uh, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions as we move to the q and phase. Thank you. Great, well, thank you to all of our speakers and uh, some fascinating topics that we heard and we can definitely see a lot of overlap and potential collaboration between our researchers and between Canada and India. Um, so we are a, a bit over time, but that is okay. We have some good questions that have been posted already for our speakers. Um, we have been given the okay by our uh, convener that we can go a bit over time here to, to answer our questions. So um, please feel free to hang on with us for a few extra minutes uh, past our, our scheduled end time. So I will read out the questions and then um, what we'll do is we'll limit the answers to only one of our panel speakers at this time. So the first question, um, is more on a high level. And the question is, what is the outlook on general availability to the medical community for these machine learning predictive models in everyday use for humanity? Um, Shiroz, do you wanna answer that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, I can touch upon that because we, uh, in, in many of our studies, we actually work uh, uh, with clinicians and, uh, and, and patients I think uh, one of our speakers already talked about that this, this trust factor, then I think another aspect is, is the feasibility uh, factor. 
whenever we we design these these AI solutions, you know, like most of the times, it's it's all engineers and 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 computer science people, and me especially coming from computer science. And when I started working uh, with this population in a, in a clinical setting, it was like overwhelming. It was very different experience for me because I was trained in a in a different environment. And I think so. I think building that that trust. Uh, finding the opportunities to work with clinicians uh, is, is, is very important in finding the synergies and to understand the perspectives of patients as well. I mean, you can, you can build a very clunky, very you know, fancy technology that nobody will use. So, so, so what is the point of that? Uh, so I think a lot of these factors play a role in their actual deployment and in, 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 and in actual uh, usability and in, in our lot of work that we are doing and Alex Maladis is also uh, our you know partner in many of these studies so we are actually trying to make life simpler easier and uh, you know in trying to improve these 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 models by involving a lot of these stakeholders so that's that's what I think right thank you Shrew. so if people can just mute themselves just so we uh, reduce the feedback thank you the next question is, how do you see the future of nano sensors for startup ventures? Um, who'd like to take that one? Uh, let's see. Faisal, do you want to talk a little bit about nano sensors? I have no idea of nano sensors. Uh, just okay, then I'll Faisal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who else on our on our team here would like to answer a question about nano sensors? Maybe Parswal Patel can talk about. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I can I can talk about uh, startup ventures, but we we haven't uh, to be completely honest, we haven't looked at uh, uh, nano sensors as as, uh, as part of our, our uh, either a part of our portfolio or uh, the startups that we evaluated. So I'm certainly not an expert on on that one. Sorry. All right. Well, let's put this one up to this question has stumped our our panel. So we will uh, set that one aside and we'll try to get an answer to you. Uh, the next question, is there any correlation between the synthetic drugs and Ayurvedic drug algorithm study? Anyone? It looks like another question has stumped us. Uh, so Pawan, who, who posted that question, maybe if you want to type in a bit more detail, we can try to come back to that question uh, after the next one. Okay. Uh, the next question, it's a bit of a long one, so, so stick with me here. So till now, the FDA has approved several AI-based software as a medical device, but those only include algorithms that are locked prior to marketing. However, in the context of the U.S.'s 21st Century Cures Act of year 2016, that encourages usage of real-world data from sensors and explicitly promotes digital health technologies, what additional pathways can be set up by regulators to enable unlocked algorithms for refinements and improvements while balancing risks and rewards? So there's no lack of, of easy questions here. Um, I can, I can try to take oh, shorter. Oh, oh yeah, video, video, there you go. Yep, go for it. No, so, you know, this is a very, very, very valid question. And uh, a lot of the machine learning world is actually thinking about this because, uh, uh, you know, the whole premise of ML is that you know, you get to improve the algorithm with time, you know, it may be on a weekly basis, a monthly basis or annual basis, but, uh, you know, and, and that's what we're building our platform also on the, the, you know, the singular goal that you get failed cases back to the developers so that the developers make some changes. So I do know that the FDA is acutely aware of this uh, idea. Uh, they had a workshop uh, early in early 2020 where, uh, this was one of the themes of discussion is to, you know, how do they handle this whole process? Because the other challenge with deep learning, and I'm sure uh, many of my colleagues on the panel would, would know about this in more detail, is that uh, you don't, that it, it doesn't change in a predictable manner, right? So what that means is that the FDA or whoever the regulator is would need to have a certain, you know, set of test um, cases where these algorithms could be run and, you know, one could see how they change post uh, retraining or whatever. So it's not an easy, easy thing for the FDA as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that it also goes against the whole 21st Century Cures Act. But uh, 
uh, and I don't envy their position, but I know for a fact that, you know, the FDA is thinking about this and, uh, you know, they are also thinking about things like, well, not even retraining, but even changing thresholds for classification algorithms, right? Can you do context specific thresholding? So that's, uh, but yeah, I, I, I wish I had the answer, <laughs> you know, I, I would be a much more significant right. person. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Dr. Mahajan, this question is for you as well. Can you explain the super resolution part of your work? Is it single image or multiple image or example based? Yeah, I think I know who's asking that. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> well, well, they're uh, down as anonymous, so we're not sure. Who is. <laughs> so, uh, I so uh, basically in super resolution, you know, it it can work in in both ways. Uh, the examples I showed. Uh, one of them, the MRI algorithm works on a 3D basis. So the entire MR data set goes into the algorithm and then the output is a up-resolved, uh, you know, data set of the entire 3D volume. Whereas the CT algorithm works on a slice-to-slice -slice basis. So it comes down to the architecture that's been chosen by the developer. You know, each of them has pros and cons. Uh, we, we do a lot of image translation work, uh, you know, which again starts with 2D. So, you know, trying to make pet images from CT images and other crazy things. So we start with 2D and then we realize that 2D is not good enough. So we go to yeah, like multi-slice 3D. And then, you know, once maybe one day NVIDIA gives us some compute, you know, we could, we could go to full, full 3D. So it's very uh, context and developer specific and also compute specific. Great, thank you. Um, a question here in the chat, how can AI be used in health insurance or public health schemes? So- You don't like to take uh, a shot then? Yeah. Yeah, I can comment on that a bit. Um, I think there's a few interesting applications in the context of uh, where some of these models for machine learning can be used. Uh, I, th I think one of the favorite uh, one of my favorite examples is in the context of uh, nudging people to uh, do things. So uh, one example of this could be in the context of if you, so, uh, you know, when I spoke, I gave the example of, can you predict the onset of diabetes? And this is something that, for example, an insurance provider might be interested in because if they were to intervene at that point, just call up the patient and say, hey, uh, we'd like you to go in for uh, just a checkup. Uh, it's not going to be charged. Uh, the reason we want it is that if there's any intervention to be taken now, it saves everyone involved a ton of costs in the future. So I, that's an example of where a practical um, model uh, that is good at doing prediction can be uh, incorporated into the day-to-day -day workings of a health insurance company to have better uh, health outcomes. And the same is true uh, for a public health scheme as well. <clears throat> Great, well, thank you very much. So that seems to be all the questions from our audience. So again, I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, for their wonderful presentations. And at this point, I'll hand it back to Arun who will conclude our session for this evening and for the morning. Uh First of all, thank you. Before I say anything, let me ask Dr. Lakshmanan who wants to say something. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chokalingam. Thank you very much, Alex, all friends. I just want to make one announcement here. As part of the summit, we're also bringing forward, uh, giving awards to startup entrepreneurs. Young entrepreneurs under the age of 40 Kindly submit your proposals. We will have five awards. The awards will be given on May 21st. And I'm requesting all of you to kindly pass the message to the audience and your friends. The proposals can be in healthcare, focusing if you can on the pandemics, artificial intelligence and biotechnology. So the uh, Canada India Foundation has come forward to encourage startup entrepreneurs, people with good ideas, to submit their proposals, and they, uh, it will be the, they, it will be selected by uh, by 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 by, by a uh, group of uh, judges. There will be five or six judges, many in the area. So they are, they are, after choosing it, the awards will be given on May twenty first. The sponsors are can, companies from Canada as well as from India. I want to thank you all. 
uh, Professor Chokalingam, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lakshmanan. I think that's an important message to all the people who are listening, as well as the panelists to convey the message to your younger colleagues, or even some of you who are, who are under 40, who might be eligible. And uh, please do take advantage of it. And we want to promote innovation. And uh, coming back to the today's webinar, it was an excellent session. So we had all three webinars going from strength to strength to strength. And this is one of the most difficult subject people to comprehend. And it started nicely with the Rahul putting the foundation and then it just built up one after another. And we were able to look at some of the clinical slides and how the slices are being analyzed. And then to the real world application and all the way to SMEs and what their criteria is, what their conditions are. And then finally, if you are an investor, what are you looking for? So I think this is a wholesome webinar and the credit goes to Alex who put the sequence of speakers. We got all these wonderful speakers at random because of their abilities and uh, Alex beautifully put them all in the sequence. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Ritesh Malik who will say the final closing and thank you from CIF. But before I do that, I want to recognize a few people who have been working very silently, and that is Arti Basin and Nikita Thakkar, who are quietly moving the slides one after another so that we could save time. And they have been working very, very hard. And I also want to remind that the white paper by this group will also be presented on the 20th of May. And the interest on artificial intelligence is so high, we will have a separate session on the 19th of May, managed, co-managed by the Agewell Institute of which Alex is the scientific director mm -hmm. and the Canada India Healthcare Summit jointly with Agewell will host a special workshop or a seminar on the 19th morning around say 10 o'clock Canada time, which could be around say 7.30 in India, but a little more manageable time for people to join. And uh, please do join and stay tuned and visit our website more often so that we will have the information updated. And we have got an excellent selection of uh, speakers who will be speaking at the summit. With that, I will request uh, Mr. Ritesh Malik, who is the national convener for Canada India Foundation to give the closing remarks and the thank you note. Thank you, Dr. Chokalingam. What an impressive way to conclude our three-part webinar series leading up to the Canada-India Health Summit in May. Today's proceedings, along with the presentations that were made during the earlier webinars, clearly demonstrate the quality and integrity of the speakers, as well as the dedication by the core team that put it all together. To be frank, I cannot claim to have understood every detail presented in today's session but I know enough to accept that artificial intelligence will play a major role in humanity's fight against COVID-19 and equally deadly viruses that may follow. Today, we had seven experts presenting their findings on AI and its many applications in managing and treating the disease. Dr. Rahul Gopalakrishnan, Dr. Shehroz Khan, Dr. Sarat Chandar Parthipan, Dr. Faisal Beg, Dr. Vidur Mahajan, Dr. Vibha Tyagi, and Mr. Pariswal Patel. Thank you to each one of you for your contribution today and wish you continued success in your work to understand and combat the many aspects of the pandemic. I also want to thank the main drivers behind this important initiative, Dr. Lucky Lakshmanan, who envisioned it years ago, Mr. Satish Thakkar, and Dr. Arun Chokalingam, who has been a tireless an inspirational figure in getting everyone together and preparing for the big event in May. Our thanks to today's moderator, Dr. Alex Mihalidis.
thanks to our youth ambassadors nikita thakkar and aarti basin for their continued hard work with this event pavan chankotra and kalyan sundaram for all the back end work today's proceedings is proof of the deep understanding and education possible when the best minds from both canada and india get together on a common platform to discuss and solve problems let's make sure that the may event is a great tribute to the potential of canada india engagement thanks also to our partners toronto long term care uhn council general of india in toronto and fikki thank you all and see you all in may till then stay well stay safe namaste thank you thank you thank, thank you, you.